Yes. The evil awaits in the other side. Lord of Illusions Explained. This video explores the movie Lord of Illusions, which is a fantastic combination of horror, grand guignol, and detective narrative that lures the audience into a tangled web of deception, crime, and sorcery. Bacula is a pleasant lead, just easygoing enough to use the Philip Marlowe flair, but not afraid of a little rough and tough, even if it's in the sack, with a newly bereaved Dorothy whose morning suit seems to be a diaphanous pink dress. While not quite as graphic as the Hellraiser movies, it really doesn't hesitate. There are some blood splatter filled scenes, however, the initial CGI is disgraceful by the great practical application. It's a pity since not only is the theatrical version on Blu-ray so crisp, but this version is more pleasant, elaborating on the characters and making it more logical. The director's cut is also present, but only on DVD, and the quality dip is evident, with several sequences notably soft. The director's cut also contains an insightful commentary by Barker, who discusses the changes between the two versions and the filmmaking technique and story fundamentals. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Weary private investigator Harry de Amour, Bacula, fresh off from an exorcism case, is recruited for what appears to be a simple duty of following a woman called Dorothy to a show by her spouse, on stage, magician Philip Swan. Swan is murdered in a horrible accident while performing. Meanwhile, a solid dark magician named Nix, who was murdered by Dorothy 13 years ago when Swan and his comrades liberated her from his cult, is attempting to revive himself. It's up to an insane sorcerer, Butterfield, to find out where Nix's body is buried from Dorothy by whatever's needed. Bacula is a lovely and clever hero who is always a welcome presence on screen. On the other hand, Sherman's vicious and horrifying portrayal of Butterfield shines out. He is a horrible character, unusual and uncompromised brewed, and it's not just his excessively tight trousers. Clive Barker directed Lord of Illusions in 1995, based on his own short tale, The Last Illusion. The plot begins in the early 1980s at a rundown cult stronghold in the Mojave Desert, blending noir with horror. Nix, the leader known as the Puritan, possesses mystical abilities that he offers to share with his entranced followers. The first visuals we see establish the tone for the film's doomsday cult's dark and deadly world. Barker's camera moves slowly throughout the facility of the cult. Cages, feathers, bloodstains, and skeleton constructions merge with the dusty, worn environment. A violent wind disrupts the artifacts, bringing them to life. It's something out of a fantasy, something directly from Barker's head. These photos are intercut with views of a caravan of automobiles speeding towards an unknown destination. There is a sense of impending dread. Unfortunately for Nix, some gang members believe he has gone too far by kidnapping a young girl. The rebels, led by Nix's prized pupil Philip Swan, manage to overwhelm and conquer him. They bind him in an iron mask and bury him deep in the Mojave Dunes, scattering his faithful followers to the winds. Early in 1982, self-proclaimed Puritan cult leader Nix and his cult members plot to sacrifice a young woman in hopes of gaining more black magic abilities. Swan is rendered useless by some face-melting magic, so the little girl grabs a revolver and shoots Nix. The film is about detection, and it borrows from the hard-boiled genre of literature. It takes Barker about 15 minutes to introduce Dia Moore, but when he does, it sounds like it came straight from the pages of practically every Sam Spade or Philip Marlowe story. Dia Moore is first seen in a shabby flat and he looks to be down on his luck, as do many noir investigators. While Barker has stated that Bacula is Diamor and now creates Diamor with Bacula in mind, Lord of Illusion's major flaw may be Bacula's performance. He doesn't quite capture the rigid and cruel temperament embodied by his archetypal forefathers. Bacula performs the part with a sense of fun. He's sluggish, almost silly. Let's fast forward 13 years. Harry the Amor, a surrealist private investigator who enjoys handling supernatural cases, sits in his office. The Amor is a complete wreck due to a botched exorcism that claimed the life of a young kid. So when he receives a lead on some supposedly easy job far away from his circumstances in New York, he jumps on a plane to LA. The work then devolves into something considerably worse. Swan now lives in a Beverly Hills house with Dorothy as a famous stage illusionist. 
antagonist. On a different tangent, Philip Swan believes Nix's followers murdered Quaid. Dorothy, who read about Dia Moore in the newspaper report about Quaid, hires him before leaving Los Angeles. Dorothy is concerned about her spouse. Dia Moore promises to see if Quaid's assassins are after Philip and Dorothy invites him to his next act. Swan is slain on stage as a new illusion fails, and he is stabbed with numerous swords. Dia Moore is attacked by Butterfield and Miller while investigating backstage. In defending himself, he murders Miller accidentally, but Butterfield escapes. Dia Moore visits the Magic Castle the next day. Dia Moore discovers Swan's illusions contained genuine magic. He learned from Nix after entering the repository, a place reportedly housing every magic knowledge known to man. In the meantime, the young magician has gained the reputation, but the endeavor has also skewed his mind a little. In contrast, the girl he saved from his adversary and later brought about the latter's comeuppance has become his wife. Nonetheless, their connection isn't genuine and she eventually becomes associated with Bakula. Dia Moore infiltrates Nix's former trustworthy man who would carry out the majority of the work, Butterfield, and murders a fortune teller reader we remember from Swan's assault on Nix's property. After seeing the murder, Philip Swan, now a well-known magician, hires Dia Moore to look into it further. With the help of the hired Dia Moore, Swan and his lady Dorothy race to discover a means to stop Butterfield from resurrecting Nix to his old Puritan hood. Dorothy tells Dia Moore that she is the girl Nix had abducted years before, saved by Swan, and married to him out of kindness and responsibility. Dorothy and Dia Moore fall in love, and Dia Moore is then assaulted by otherworldly powers. Suspicious of a ploy, Dia Moore unlocks Swan's casket, revealing something shocking to everyone on screen and off screen. Dorothy, a 12 year old prisoner, aids in the gruesome murder of her captor Nix, an evil cult leader with magical abilities by his former apprentice, Philip Swan. 13 years later, she she seeks the help of an occult investigator when former cult members affiliated with Swan, now a successful illusionist, are threatened by Nix's most devoted and vicious disciple. Dia Moore agrees to keep the charade going. Dia Moore chases a suspect during Swan's burial. The man, enraged and envious, confronts Dia Moore, then says he disguised himself as an illusionist to avoid being sought as a sorcerer. If Nix is revived, the detective tells him to battle the devoted cultists and Nix together. They merge their forces, unworldly powers, and intellectual influences to counter the sadistic cult leader. Finally, there's a chance for you to see the last battle, when the old mentor appears with an offer of confrontation. The latter, having disposed off the other members of his cult since he judged them unworthy of his lofty status. Of course, Jansen and Bakula become entangled in the scuffle and nearly escape with their lives. Butterfield brutalizes Valentine in exchange for Nix's body, then kidnaps Dorothy. After discovering Nix's body, Butterfield whacks Valentine and takes Nix's corp back to the cult's former residence in the desert. Nix's supporters have gathered to witness his resurrection. Now frail and terrible, Nix vows to share his knowledge and power with others. Nix declares the worthy inheritor of his wisdom by opening a vast pit in the ground that consumes the cultists. Nix has been resurrected. Nix murders his devoted followers, declaring, none of you are worthy. He's going to throw Dorothy down the pit when Harry intervenes and saves her. Cults of the United States have been accused of utilizing mind control tactics to attract adherents in sexual assaults, prostitution, abductions, and fraudulent fundraising. The Puritans demonstrate that a solid religious drive does not have to be accompanied by a leader who claims to be God. But antiquity is significant. It enables adherents, among other things, to live and believe within the confines of a complicated intellectual tradition. A human claiming to be God and placing accompanying demands on their community belongs to a far simpler conceptual tradition, the personality cult. The press, police enforcement, and the courts may quickly condemn self-proclaimed deities because they frequently do and believe disturbing things. Talking of cultists, the Puritans are so dedicated that they slaughter their relatives and colleagues before before traveling to the desert retreat. They then continue to cut and burn their hair to sacrifice for their malicious messiah before dying at the hands of him, whom they revere. They are subsequently buried alive for eternity, permanently sprouting from the cell's dirt-filled flooring. Instead of being a concept that plays itself out, Lord of Illusions just tells a beautiful narrative. It goes in many ways, embracing multiple genres, spanning years, and going all out in the last act. Horror was such a rut in the 1990s that it's difficult to imagine that a film as distinct and intriguing as this one didn't find a larger audience. Clive bends the enigmas of magic with the perils of a demonic cult 
to create one of the most terrifying horror villains ever. Nyx is a diabolical embodiment of evil that possesses total mastery over elements such as fire, gravity, and even the human will and soul. Daniel Von Bargen portrays Nyx brilliantly, and the hairs on the back of your neck will rise when he declares, I was born, to slaughter the world in his most nasty tone of voice. Scott Batula is the private investigator hired by the gorgeous Famke Jansen to keep a check on her husband, who previously buried Nyx, but now fears his resurrected body. Based on his novel, The Last Illusion, Barker's script attempts to merge horror, mystery, and the private detective genres with little success. The narrative is tight and hilarious, and the images are vibrant and exciting. While the film's use of early digital effects means that its sleight of hand is occasionally visible, Barker serves up his usual dish of earthy narrative. It's all about the flesh, sweat, sex, and blood, burrowing more profound in the hopes of discovering the insubstantial essence that may lay beyond the ultimate illusion of all, death. Though not a mystery in the classic sense, after all, Barker reveals to us what happened in the first few minutes of the film. There is a sense of discovery as Dia Moore attempts to figure out what the heck is going on. The plot isn't hesitant to take a few twists and turns, but not the type that reroutes the entire narrative or requires the audience to rethink what came before. Barker's film draws on influences ranging from H.P. Lovecraft to Raymond Chandler to Charles Manson, and the result is a scary movie that feels unlike anything else trying to come out at that time, save perhaps John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, another film that took years to find an audience and re-establish its reputation. God, no. The cast is strong all around, with Scott Bachula as Detective Harry D'Amour, with the ideal blend knowledge and humor, delivering short barbs that make light of the issue while getting to the bottom of it. Of course, in one of her early performances, Famke Jansen is a fantastic femme fatale. Clive Barker brilliantly adapts his original short tale behind the camera, providing an excellent combination of horror and detective narrative, much better represented in the extended director's cut, albeit the parts don't exactly fit together. Nyx, the central antagonist, might have been developed more, as could have the extraordinary relationship to the world of illusionists and magicians. The photography and use of color in Lord of Illusions highlight how Barker has progressed since his debut, the vastly great Hellraiser 1987. The film depicts the dynamic range of audio components. The dialogue is crisp and clear, the sound effects are good, and the soundtrack is given the depth required to create the film's required feeling of impending doom. There are no indications of age-related problems. Practically, Lord of Illusions is excellent except for several visual tricks that fall flat. Barker's obsession with religious iconography and bondage images continues. There are a couple of great gore sequences, but there should be no anticipation for another Hellraiser. Someone gets impaled with daggers, bullet wounds splattering blood everywhere, nails driven into people's brains, animal carcasses, scalpel stabbings, and people's flesh peeling off their faces. The film projects the perfect balance of graphic scenes and visually appealing images that give the audience an overall pleasant experience. One of the most exemplary sequences in the movie includes includes Swan revealing a new illusion to the black tie audience. He's tied to a rotating wheel under another wheel from which several swords swing hanging, each one over a critical portion of his body. The secret is to let go of each limb precisely like the blade drops in it. Swan dies a terrible death, one extremity or critical organ at a time if the trick fails. Faces transform into bones and rotten sores. Figures soar through the air, tunnels emerge into the Earth's depth, dreams become true, and Nyx's terrible lusts are horrifyingly exposed. This sound and light show lasted a little too long for my liking, but it was well staged and horror lovers will get their money's worth. <laughs> Barker's intention with Lord of Illusions was to effortlessly merge a horror narrative with a hard-boiled noir. This did not sit well with the studio. Fearing an adverse reaction, the studio selected a shorter genre feature. Somewhat of fighting the studio, Barker understood he'd have to surrender his vision for a theatrical release, knowing full well that his whole image would be shown via the director's cut. Part of the movie's aim is that it is a genre-breaking film. It shifts from film noir to horror and back again, making the picture work, but MGM slash 
Yue was insistent. Lord of Illusions may not be Barker's most pleasing picture, but it has a lot of value for those who enjoy both horror and noir. Lord of Illusions marked Barker's return to filmmaking after his contributions to the first two Candyman films, both of which were based on Barker's short tale. Almost 10 years after his directorial debut with Hellraiser, the film reflects a more mature and confident filmmaker. It was, however, just Barker's third film, and there are some structural flaws, as with Nightbreed. The main issue is that Barker devotes more emphasis to cinematic mood than plot. There is an overwhelming sensation that there is more to life than we get. Perhaps this is because Harry D'Amour came before the picture. Before Lord of Illusions, D'Amour appeared in four Barker films, including a critical role in 1994's Everville. There is usually information left unsaid throughout the adaptation process, often in parts that must be decoded or lighted for those familiar with the literary antecedent. Or perhaps Barker's script is a little messy. Despite its thin storyline, the film's camp antagonists interest Interestingly, otherworldly theory and well-executed effects may save it for those who can endure stylized torture and gore. The customary utilization of an opaque atmosphere and occult imaginings that are frightening as they meddle with subjects they have no business tampering with is one of the few decent components. In addition, the hunt for the leader's writings and hiding places make for some fun times, and the conclusion and the decaying hallways of his sanctuary with the full use of dark magic is a lot of fun. The main issue with the film is that it's far too long and takes far too long to get going because there are just so many unnecessary scenes that add excessive time to the proceedings that there's no actual use in featuring them, which include the locations of them in the Magic Club, the next home from the funeral, and the numerous failed attempts on his life that make the cult seem wholly incompetent to risk that kind of exposure that often with so many characters. In an apparent attempt to include as much gore, horror makeup, and video manipulation as possible, the film withholds practically no information information from the audience, thereby undercutting the mystery and underplaying the story's protagonist. Lord of Illusions is a solo work for individuals who are just marginally interested in Barker's work or appreciate a genre mishmash. Barker successfully combines a feeling of severe fear with a light touch. At the same time, as it screams Barker's aesthetics, it is unlike any of his earlier works. The Collector's Edition is the definitive edition of the film, complete with a fantastic set of bonus features and both film edits. It is worth taking a chance upon. Lord of Illusion is a superb blend of horror and detective, complete with horrible makeup effects and more than enough suspense to keep you interested. Barker has a strong command of supernatural themes and he incorporates some of his personal hobbies into the picture. For example, his frightening fascination with masochism as well as the persistent undercurrents of homosexuality and sexual depravity. The mood given is dark ambience with virtually no comedy. Clive Barker has written an exceedingly macabre and dark story that takes place almost exclusively in the mysterious realm of magicians, illusionists, and sorcerers. Indeed, a one-of-a-kind environment that begs for an outstanding horror picture, things grow chaotic, gory, and frighteningly mad at the conclusion. Barker, like H.P. Lovecraft, has a talent for the strange and terror-fueled fear of the unknown. It's one thing to use magic, but it's quite another to summon the dark forces. Nonetheless, even if it falls short of Clive Barker's previous accomplishments, this is a good piece of art, in my opinion. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. Touch the darkness.